Welcome to Boobs Aren't Worth Dying For, the podcast dedicated to integrative health and healing from breast cancer and breast cancer treatment using the best of conventional and natural medicine. Your host, Deborah Beaumont, is an advanced practice nurse, functional medicine practitioner, and fellow breast cancer survivor. Welcome to today's podcast of Boobs Aren't Worth Dying For. I am so excited today to have... um, a woman that I have followed and admired her work uh, as my guest. I am excited that she's taken the time to be here today and really um, uh, can't wait for you to hear the information that she has to share. I would like to take the time to introduce Ellen Jacobs. Ellen is a breast cancer survivor and holistic cancer strategist who helps people make better, healthier, less toxic choices for their healing. She emphasizes the critical nature of addressing the root cause of cancer and not just the symptoms, which basically means the tumor. Ellen specializes in understanding the role of estrogen in breast cancer and debunks the myths associated with uh, many modern treatments. She brings a plethora of knowledge to her practice and will help you think outside the box so you can incorporate every lifeline you may need for long-term survival and health. Ellen is a contributing editor for The Truth About Cancer and was creator and host of the Survive and Live Well radio show on the Cancer Support Network. She is on the medical advisory board for BeatCancer.org and is on the advisory board to the Radical Remission Project. Ellen has been featured on CNN Money, Breast Cancer Wellness, Talk About Health, the Radical Remission Project, Breast Cancer Answers, and many others, and has written for numerous organizations and publications. She was the former executive director of the Emerald Heart Cancer Foundation. You can learn more about Ellen at ellenjacobs.com. That's Ellen with a Y. And um, we're going to learn so much more by talking with her today. I'm so excited to have you here, Ellen. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Um, I am. Uh, I have uh, followed your writings and your work for quite a while, and one of the very common um, areas that I think women struggle with pretty universally across the board is the use of tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors, basically estrogen blocking agents. And I am so excited that you can speak to that. And that's something that you are so um, uh, well versed in and that you study, because I think this is a huge issue and a huge thing that women need to know about and they have questions about. And it's really hard to find very comprehensive answers and very comprehensive information. Well, it is a big topic because there's two um, sort of problems with the whole automatically every woman either gets tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor if they have an estrogen sensitive um, breast cancer. However, the, the problem with that is estrogen in itself does not cause breast cancer. It's not the reason anybody got breast cancer. It can be a contributing factor. But if you think about every woman has estrogen and your great-great-grandmother had estrogen, but all those people didn't get breast cancer. And why is that? That is because we now have a, a new fellow in town, and that's called xenoestrogens. And that's been the difference of why people are getting breast cancer in increasing rates over the last 50 years. It's the introduction of all of the cosmetics, the cleaning products, the Um, home care products, pesticides, and it's a cumulative factor. So to target estrogen as this big villain isn't really fair. It happens to be the only tool in in the doctor's toolbox because they can't give you a pill that gets rid of environmental toxins. They can't give you a pill that gets rid of um, emotional toxins. They can't even handle some of the viruses that are very much linked to um, breast cancer, such as the Epstein-Barr virus. So, but back on the topic of this this evil estrogen. When estrogen is in balance with progesterone, life works well, your PMS symptoms are very mild or non-existent, you don't get a lot of hot flashes, and you basically feel pretty good. On the other spectrum, when you have absolutely no progesterone, you may miscarry a lot frequently, you have terrible PMS symptoms, and that may mean you were chronically, since young adulthood, um, deficient in progesterone. So how does that happen? That comes from stress. It comes for a lot of reasons. Um, the food, um, there's, there's multiple things that contribute to low progesterone. But when a woman turns around 45, her estrogen starts to plummet. Unfortunately, progesterone 
really starts to plummet. So you become even more out of balance. So doctors want to say to you, okay, let's inhibit your, let's block your estrogen or let's give you tamoxifen so it can sit on the receptors and not allow this um, cell replication to go on. Well, that's all good and fine, but when you look at this, the side effects, you've got tamoxifen giving you uh, tumor and bone pain, muscle pain, blood clots, increased risk of endometrial and uterine cancer, um, weight gain, depression, fatigue. Some of those are minor. Some of those are a big deal. Some people don't ever recover from some of these things, and certainly nobody wants to get another cancer. Basically, people feel lousy on it. Other people don't have such a bad time with it. Um, but then you look at aromatase inhibitors, which if you go on the Komen site, they clearly say, we don't know what the long-term effects are. Well, actually, we do. They're called heart attack, um, major breakages from osteoporosis, um, heart pain. I mean, you, can, you can go on and on, severe joint and muscle damage. Um, so it's not to be taken lightly, and doctors say, oh, well, we'll, we'll try this one. If it doesn't work, we'll give you another one. Great. Now I can get side effects from many different drugs. But again, estrogen, by the time they're giving that you an aromatase inhibitor, your estrogen is low. And you need that estrogen to support your heart health, your bone health, and about 140 other essential proceeds in your body. So before you accept something like that, one, you could get your hormones tested. You could have your GYN or your oncologist, if the person is cooperative, um, get the, the hormones tested and see how, how out of whack am I? How much you know, work do I have to do? Could I eat some things that raise my progesterone? Do I really need to take a progesterone cream? Um, I never, ever advise synthetic hormones. Those are definitely linked to initiation and, prog and progression of breast cancer. But and let there me just clarify your yeah. statement there. Synthetic hormones, when you say you never recommend that, we're talking about prescriptions that doctors give you. That, that's what we mean when we say synthetic hormones. They're manufactured by the drug companies. They're a synthetic process. So. Right. I, I just want to bring that up because actually, as I'm listening to you, it, it really strikes me about one of the things that I talk about a lot is that there's a whole world of misunderstanding about estrogen, whether you have cancer or not. If you're just a woman going into menopause or perimenopause, there's a whole misunderstanding about whether to supplement with estrogen or what estrogen does. And in my opinion, medical doctors are, I don't agree with how they even view estrogen in a woman's body to begin with. And then when you add cancer or a, a hormone-mediated cancer on top of that, then it just really goes off the rail. And I don't think that they're trained to have that comprehensive discussion. And I think that's one of the points you're bringing up so well here. Yes, that's right. They're not really trained. I mean, the, what do you learn in, in medical school? You learn how to write a prescription. An oncologist didn't go to school. He didn't really learn much about hormones. He left that to the OBGYNs, right? right? Because that was their job. So they're not well versed in it. All they know is that the standard of care says if you have estrogen sensitive breast cancer, you get this drug. And it's they're actually required by law to recommend the standard of care or their license is actually in jeopardy. So in some ways, we can't blame them. I remember when I declined the tamoxifen and she said, but Ellen, I know it's a bad drug. It's just it's the only thing I have to give you. Right. Right. And I thought, well, that's not good enough. You know? right. It's just right. not. She says, it's a terrible drug. And I said, well, this is crazy. Why are you know, like, why are people being told to take these? And it really is because they don't have anything else for you. Um, but that's not true. It's only all they have to offer you. But there are many natural remedies for estrogen. I mean, if you truly have an imbalance of estrogen, it's probably because of xenoestrogens or because you are such a stress mess and that your progesterone is down to zero and you don't have that balance. See, uh, progesterone supports the P53 gene, which is a, is a good gene. And... Um, the estrogen can support the BCL2 gene, which is the one that says, okay, go ahead, cancer, you can do your thing. So we want to put the brakes on that. So we want to raise our progesterone and lower our estrogen if we have to. But again, that first you have to know that you have that so much estrogen to, to block or reduce. And again, most people don't. Remember how mom used to go on HRT because she was miserable once her estrogen started to, to plummet. 
So doctors aren't even thinking about that. They're just trying to reduce it even further, which makes no sense. So before you just say, I'm going to start reducing my estrogen, it would be better to raise the progesterone and or if you need to reduce some of your estrogen, think about getting rid of those cleaning products, beauty pl- products and the like, and even your um, plastic, your BPA and your, and you know, people all think that BPA is just in your water bottles, but it's not. It's on your toilet paper, your paper towels, your paper napkins, your copy paper, because your, your grocery receipts, are your grocery BPA. receipts are the worst. Yeah. You never, ever take them. Even if you go to Whole Foods now, the girls are all, or the men too, they're all wearing gloves. And that is great because then they're not absorbing this BPA all day long. You should so, see me at Walmart where you where you have to take a receipt. I, I carry actually gloves and I put on a glove and then I pick up the receipt with my fingertips. And, yep. and the cashiers are always looking at me like, oh, there's that crazy lady. And I'm like, seriously, I should be giving you gloves for Christmas. You people deal with this all day. <laughs> so... That's absolutely right. I'm hoping that soon that the, it, it's everywhere that people are wearing, you know, the cashiers are wearing gloves because that is, is the worst. So, again, these are the reasons that we have breast cancer, not because of our own natural estrogen. Um, but what do we do instead of tamoxifen? So instead of tamoxifen, understand that there is no one substitute. People come to me all the time. I get emails all day long. What is the substitute, Ellen? Just tell me. What is the substitute? Right, I said, the there quick answer. It's not, right, there's no quick answer. It's a whole thing of changing the food that you eat, the products that you use. But but certain sub- things like DIM, which is a D-I-M, short for a very, very long word, it's excellent for detoxification. It helps to help you metabolize your estrogen. Just like you change the oil in your car, you don't want to keep using the same estrogen. You want to use it it out you don't you know you don't want to keep reusing the estrogen so your liver gets a little bit overburdened so if we can support the liver with dim with milk thistle um, and a few other things these substances all help us to metabolize the estrogen use it and get rid of it and then it's a you know it's it's health a healthier version of the tamoxifen flaxseed is one of my favorite things because ground flaxseed has a plethora of anti-cancer benefits to it. And it also sits on the receptors instead of the tamoxifen without causing any side effects. In most cases, if you're allergic to, to flaxseed, that's a problem, you know. But in general, it, most people tolerate uh, flaxseed very well. The trick is to always freshly grind it every time you use it. I mean, if you want to make one batch in the morning and use it during the day, but you don't want to store ground flaxseed and you don't want to purchase ground flaxseed. Buy the whole seeds, get yourself a small $20 coffee grinder and zap them and then use them right then and there. They oxidize very quickly. And you, that's the last thing you want to do is have rancid flaxseed going into your body. Right. And things like, yeah, things like um, taking magnesium, vitamin E, zinc, um, sulfur-rich cruciferous vegetables. All of these things are detoxifiers. They help you to make more progesterone, um, vitamin D selenium, all of these things which have anti-cancer benefits on their own are all going to help you to balance these these hormones, to raise that progesterone so that you feel good and your um, estrogen has an antagonist. Um, well, I'm, be, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I think you've brought up so many uh, really important things here, and I, and I think that some of these are probably really new concepts to a lot of people because they're not hearing this from their doctors, and I'm not bashing doctors. It's just not what they're learning from their doctors. You know, as I said, the misunderstanding about estrogen, and I think the premise, you know, the foundation of everything that you've said is we have to understand the role of estrogen. Estrogen is protective in women's bodies. And as a woman's estrogen naturally decreases as she ages, not even related to cancer, we know that their chances of cardiac disease and other diseases go up. That's that's because estrogen is protective. So when we're going to these doctors trying to figure out how to manage cancer and they're saying, get rid of all the estrogen, we're taking away that protection. That's why we have it to begin with. And um, and so one of the things I read in, in something that you wrote is that taking these drugs may uh, improve your cancer survival, but there's no proof that it improves your overall survival because 
you're just as likely to die of a heart attack or another complication from the lack of estrogen. And I think that's such an important point for women to understand that estrogen plays a protective role in our body and in our health. And they're not hearing that. They're hearing that estrogen's the enemy. That's right, because we were given estrogen for a very good reason. It's It has all these essential functions in the body. So we don't want to take away something that was given to us that we... It, it's like saying you don't need your left arm. Right. Well... I argue that you, you know, you could survive without your left arm. I don't know if you can't survive without estrogen, but do you really want to give up your left arm? No, I don't think so. So they, they're really accusing, again, my, I said they're villainizing estrogen, which is not fair. Right. And you, you do need it. It is just better to make other changes and in some cases get to the real reason for the, for the breast cancer, like the Epstein-Barr virus, that none of them, none of these doctors will even mention to you that, because they don't know how to get rid of the Epstein-Barr. It's not, they, again, they don't have that tool. And I'm not bashing doctors. They're not taught about that in medical school. Most of them don't even understand really what Epstein-Barr is. They just know it's associated with mono. Right. They're oncologists. What do they know? They don't know about mono or anything else. I mean, it's not really their fault. But it's also hard to expect every single patient out there to know everything that they need to know. But back on the topic of the estrogen, again, it's not the villain. It is very, very important. And there are numerous studies that show that while you may not die of your breast cancer, you don't live any longer, which is, Deborah, what you were commenting that I wrote in, the, in one of the articles. Right. You know, and they even knew this about tamoxifen 20 years ago. They said you don't die of breast cancer, you just die of the, of the side effects from the tamoxifen. Well, when they were offering it to me, I said, well, that makes no sense to me. Right. I mean, right. if I'm dead, I'm dead. Right. <laughs> you know I mean, what difference does it make? Which I, I mean, maybe dying of a heart attack is less painful than dying of cancer. I don't know. But I don't know. I think it's 50 50. You know, exactly. I don't know what they're, how they can make that point, but there are numerous studies now, and they just did some major comparisons, even between whether you take tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor. And then they said, well, you know what? How about if we give you first tamoxifen and they switch you to aromatase inhibitors, then you would have less um, of the toxic side effects of each of them. And I say, well, that's true, that's an option, but you also then suffer the side effects of two drugs instead of one. Right. And then they say, well, then we'll just keep switching your aromatase inhibitor. And again, that makes no sense. If one isn't working on you, the other is not. Right. Um, in fact, you can read my article on that, why aromatase inhibitors fail. And the, the articles, the um, you can read the, the references and the resources of the studies that show that they're really not helping us. And, and again... It's a one size fits all. You've got breast cancer, they're going to tell you to take that whether it's really good for you personally. And they also aren't testing women to make sure that they have certain maybe genetic mutations or other um, situations that would not allow them to process a particular drug or any drugs. Some people are chemical sensitive. Some people have certain SNPs. Uh, these are genetic mutations that don't allow you to process certain drugs. And we know that. It's published. Well, but you know, that's, that's really interesting that because there's a couple things. The nurse and me is always telling people, you have to understand, this is something that most people don't understand. And it really came up for me last week, I was reading something on a very well known breast cancer education site. And it was really funny, because I had just finished talking to uh, doing an interview with a woman about um, sex after breast cancer. And actually, I read it before I can, because I was sort of, you know, preparing for the interview. And uh, it said, uh, you know, if you've noticed changes in your sexual desire or performance, talk to your doctor. And I, I think I spit my coffee out at that moment. I would have too. <laughs> my husband was like, what is going on? And I was like, seriously, you think that a doctor, a medically trained doctor is comfortable having a conversation with a woman about an orgasm, whether she has cancer or not? We have to get out of this mindset that a doctor knows everything. Doctors are specialists. They, and they, they're becoming more and more specialists. I mean, you'll find less and less general practitioners. Doctors specialize. So they don't know everything. And, and they know specifically, usually the area of their specialty. And bringing back to your conversation about oncologists, doctors, oncologists know about oncology, which is one phase of treating cancer, which is, you know, oncology and chemotherapy is meant to treat cell division phase of the cancer, you know, uh, 
pathophysiology. But they don't know about emotional coping. They don't know about integrative um, approaches. They don't know about nutrition. Doctors get no training in nutrition in medical school. I hate to tell people that, but it's a very rare doctor who's had any formal training in education in nutrition. doesn't mean they don't have an opinion, but they don't have any training. We can't look at these specialists to answer all of these questions for us. So I really advocate having a team. And in that, you know, so these tests that you're talking about, the genetic testing, looking at, you know, enzymes and the things that are going to affect your individual response to any of these things may not come from your oncologist. You're going to have to look outside of that. That's just not how they're trained, and they're not, they're not going to go there with you. And that's why the work that you're doing, Ellen, is so great, because if nothing else, just for women to know that there's a bigger world out there than just whether or not you have what, how you suffer through chemotherapy. But the Deborah, medical model, make, model is just so limited. Right. You make such a good point, because it's not the doctor's fault. They're not training. You can't expect this guy to know everything or this woman to, to know everything. They're very highly specialized in their field. And it's, for some of them, it's been a long time since they were in medical school. They wouldn't yeah. remember even if they did have any any discussion on food or any other kind of nutritional benefits. So, But yet they're the first one to tell you, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. And a lot of times that's just out of ignorance. It's not their fault. They just weren't trained in it, but yet I wish they wouldn't just blanketly say, no, you can't take this or you can't take that. Um, and in the case of estrogen, they really get their their patients confused when they say, oh, my goodness, don't take xenoestrogens. Don't eat, you know eat flaxseed or, or drink licorice root. Those are estrogens. Those are bad for you. Right. Right. Yet, and that's crazy and gets people very confused and very nervous over everything that they read. They read one article that says eat flax and then they, the doctor says don't. They see another article that says do this. And it, it's confusing and I wish that they would not play Mr. Know-it-all or Mrs. Know-it-all and say, you know what, which is exactly what my oncologist, she said, Ellen, I was not trained about this in medical school. I don't know. Right. You need to find out on your own. And that was, that was the best advice she could give me because she didn't know anything about the supplements I was taking. She just said, I, you know, she, she was just plain honest. Now, if the rest of them would be like that, patients would do so much better. So please, folks, don't worry about flaxseed. It actually modulates your your, your hormones and it has so many great um things that it does to you, so many anti-cancer activities that it's fantastic. Soy is a little more tricky because if it's not um, organic, it's loaded with GMOs, and that is really not good for you. Plus, a lot of people, um, their ancestors did not eat flax, uh, soy, so they really don't know how to eat it. I mean, their body doesn't know how to, to, to use it properly. So not everybody handles soy well, but um, in general, estrogens, xenoestrogens, any kind of plant, I mean, uh, phytoestrogens, not xenoestrogens, excuse me, but any kind of phytoestrogen, um, which means a plant estrogen, is good for you. Well, just Xenoestrogens little, are not, and regular estrogen is good. Well, just a little foundation, if, if this is new language for our listeners, uh, basically what Ellen and what we've been talking about are xenoestrogens, which it's now been proven there are so many um, toxins and chemicals in in everything. One of the one of the big areas of um, uh, toxicity is is in the kitchen. I, I found out when I adopted parrots uh, the, at the pet store, they said, "Well, make sure you get rid of anything that's lined in Teflon." I was like Teflon. They said, "Oh yeah, it puts off something invisible that kills birds within minutes." And I was like, wow, if it kills birds, what's it doing to us? You know, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there was a big sidewalk sale that day outside my apartment of a lot of kitchenware. But, um, but that's what we're talking about. Xenoestrogens, I, I like to explain it. Like xenoestrogens are the fake estrogens. The chemicals in our environment as Ellen has said, through um, through cosmetics, through foods, through the pesticides that is being sprayed on our foods. The big argument about GMOs is about this issue. About We've heard about BPA in plastic. Well, they've got BP something in, in just about everything. These chemicals, when they're coming into our body, they, they molecularly look like estrogen to the body. They're so similar that the body 
takes it as estrogen and and latches onto it and starts using it as estrogen, which actually displaces actual estrogen and gives us a higher overall circulating estrogen than we would normally have. And so xenoestrogen mm-hmm. just means a fake estrogen, and it means it's chemically based, and it's coming into our body through plastics, through all the things that we've mentioned, through foods, through chemicals, through all of this. So one thing that we can absolutely do is just make a conscious effort to start decreasing in every way possible. It's impossible to get away from all of them. We're just, ex- we're just bombarded with so much. But to really start making a conscious effort to I- identify where these toxins are coming into our body when they don't have to. Like not taking a cash register receipt. So, That's right. But, Deborah, that, that is wonderfully stated because that is really the problem. That's why we're flooded with these estrogens. It, and it's not our own. Our own estrogen, again, is really good. But these outside chemical estrogens are the problem. And that's where your detox comes in. Right. And that doesn't mean that you have to go off to a, a clinic or you know a spa someplace and do this massive detox. In fact, that's probably the worst thing you right. can do because you draw out so many chemicals at, at one time. You can't possibly pee them out fast enough or sweat them out fast enough. And then you're reabsorbing them into the body in other places. So you're just transplanting the toxins. So a nice slow detox, get rid of your heavy metals, get rid of... Um, all of this, I like to say BPAs, but you know, and before you go out and buy everything that says BPA free, you know that BPS is even worse. Right. So that's what they're using, right? In place of BPA, they're using BPS in a lot of products. So we want to be very, very careful not to do that. Use glass, use stainless steel, stay away from your plastics. Certainly never, ever, ever um, heat plastics. In fact, you should never even use a microwave for anything other than storing old um dishes or something that you don't know what to do with. Extra storage space in your kitchen is about the only thing that a microwave should be used for. (laughs) Um, But definitely, if you do use a microwave, never, ever, ever use plastic, plastic wrap. Um, Don't ever even use aluminum foil to wrap your leftover pizza in because anything with with acidic is going to eat that aluminum and you are basically eating that aluminum foil. If you use a styrofoam plate and you heat something on that, you are eating the styrofoam. Um, So these, as you can imagine, are not good ideas. So we want to use glass and other um, hard surfaces like that. Um, Well, these are some of the very practical things that, that you can do every day. You know, and, yeah. and it's not it's not going to be, you know, the magic pill that, you know, many of us are hoping for when we go to the doctor. But but cumulatively, it adds up. One of the biggest areas is cosmetics. We are exposed to so much um, in in cosmetics and we absorb that through our skin and it's actually absorbed. It, our GI tract has some ways of breaking down these chemicals. In a, so it's a little bit more protective and we don't even have that when we're absorbing it through our skin. Right. And these days, you know, I, 10 years ago, you would have said those products are horrible. They were slimy. They made your hair look like it was a grease ball. The, 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 the chemicals, on, I mean, the cosmetics on your face were greasy looking. But now we have, I mean, you can go to Target. You can go to Walmart. You can go online. You can buy them anywhere. And sometimes they're, the, these healthier products are cheaper than your regular products, like right. as in cleaning products. And um, we've always been amazed. We go to Whole Foods and you think it's going to cost more than then something else, they're the same price or cheaper half the time. Right, um, right. You go to Whole Foods, you get organic celery, and it's $1.49. You go to the supermarket, it's three fifty for the, you know, chemical-laden toxic celery. So you can, it don't always, it's not always more expensive to go organic or non-toxic. And these, you could go on this, um, there's a website called Vitacost. It's an oh, online, they sell, My favorite. they're wonderful, right? Groceries, um, cleaning products, all kinds of things, vitamins, and they constantly send you coupons for 20, you know, emails, 20% off today. Great. It's all oh, I know. I love today. it. I right? Love so it. you can really, you can really make these things affordable. So I, I don't want people to think that it's so overwhelming that, gosh, now my grocery bill is going to go up astronomically. It doesn't have to. And it, in fact, if you get rid of a lot of the processed foods, your grocery bill could quite actually go down. Right. Because processed foods tend to right. be very expensive. Well, it's very interesting. I lived in uh, California for a long time. And, you know, they're kind of like, on the leading edge. And, and, you know, and I do have to tell you, there were times where like the food police just, you know, pushed every button I had, and sometimes, you know, just react. And it's like, you know, the organic and the this and the that and the purity. And, and sometimes people, 
in my opinion, would go overboard with that. But the more I've learned, and, and I think this is something to communicate to people, it's like, you don't have to be an environmentalist, you don't have to, you know, you, this isn't a political thing, this is just a very practical thing. Organic means that it was raised without that, it, that your food was grown without being sprayed with pesticides. And if you think about what pesticides are meant to do, they're meant to kill organisms, and they're not, they're going to do the same thing when we ingest them. And one of the biggest ways we're getting toxins in our body is we're ingesting it in our foods, you know, and, and it's just, and now with the farmers markets and stuff, it's so much more accessible and so much easier to get these foods affordably and, and you know where they're coming from. And I think if there's been any big awareness, uh, that's been a huge thing and a huge benefit for everyone. There's a reason cancer has exploded um, and become so much more prevalent. And it's, um, I, I've read things that say since World War II that there's been somewhere between 85,000 and 200,000 new chemicals that have been introduced to our daily exposure in food, cosmetics, you know, uh, furniture, cleaner, water, water. Oh, yeah. You know, one of the best things to do is just get a water filter, just filter your your tap water. I don't care how clean the city says that it is. Just go online and look it up and buy a good water filter. Because remember, you're when you use tap water, you're drinking everybody else's um, discarded or peed out, whether whether they flush down the the pills or you pay them out, anybody else's prescription is going to be in your tap water. Right, Even exactly. If they trade it, it's still in there. So you really need a good filter. Um, well water is not perfectly safe either these days because if you wash your car with caustic chemicals and it goes down into your well, you're drinking that car wash. So you really want to be careful with your water. And that's, again, it's something very easy to do. It's not it's not fun, but you can put a filter that costs $25 on Amazon. You could buy a filter that filters out the um, chemicals, including chlorine, which are really toxic for you. So if you put those on your shower, very simple. We, got, we just got two more. Screw them in. They work like charms. And I highly recommend cleaning up the water in your life. And one of the areas when it comes to water filters that I, I love to bring up because no one ever thinks about this, and I learned this the hard way. I lived in San Francisco, which had really, you know, old pipes and, and stuff. And I would get out of the shower and I would be wheezing. I, I have reactive asthma. And I would be like, why am I wheezing? I just took a shower. And that uh, was, and I started looking it up. Well, it turns out that the chlorine and the fluoride and all the stuff that's in our drinking water actually comes through your shower as well. So mm -hmm. the, the problem there is that the heat aerosolizes it and you're breathing it in. So there's no filter. It's a very rapid absorption. So you're breathing in toxins. So one of the things I like to tell people is don't forget about your shower filter. Um, I, I believe the company, is it Aquasana? You know, they sell shower filters. I actually have a shower filter on because those very same toxins we're trying to not drink if we're if we're mindful enough to have a filter are also coming through our bath and shower water. So right, um, yeah, and as I said, it's only twenty five dollars, and you put it in the shower, right. and it it gets all that out of there because, as as you said, Deborah, you are stuck in there, right? You've got it closed in, either in glass or with plastic, right. um, you know, <laughs> shower right. curtains, yeah, yeah. and then you are right, and those are heating up. If you have a plastic shower curtain, that's heating up too, so the hot water is drawing the chemicals and the PVCs and everything else out of your shower curtain. So it's just a toxic soup. So at least if you can have, a, if you have a glass enclosed shower, um, get that shower head up there. They're not expensive, right? Um, right. You know, and and that and you, this way you're not breathing it in and you're not absorbing those chemicals through the skin. Well, I oh my god, I could talk to you about this all we day. We could go on all day, um, right? <laughs> But there's actually, uh, I, I really uh, want to kind of bring it back to where we started, which is, I, I think the one thing that you've really highlighted here is, um, if nothing else, the great misunderstanding there is uh, medically about estrogen, estrogen in our bodies. Um, one thing that I teach people, it's not just the estrogens you're taking in, but you have to have good detoxification of estrogen, or you're actually just reabsorbing used estrogen, which is even less healthy. So the fact is, is that we need estrogen. We need healthy estrogen in our body. And, and I, you know, and I get it. If you're a cancer patient, you're scared to death and you're being 
thrown all these terms and all these tests and it's like you've got an estrogen sensitive breast cancer and you know and and it's a really frightening frightening experience to try to sort through all of this and then to have a doctor telling you no you have to take this estrogen blocker and then to have someone like you or I saying well no there are other options you know and what i really like to emphasize is that is to integrate the best of all worlds doctors have their place in treatment of course they do they just, as we said, don't know everything. Um, it, it's it's funny. My first cancer experience, I had complications. So I was being treated by a, a GYN oncologist. I had complications that ended up my being treated by a vascular surgeon. And so I had two sets of doctors coming in. And when the vascular people would come in and I'd say, well, I'm having this problem with my you know, ins- abdominal incision or whatever, they'd say, oh, well, I don't do the OBGYN stuff. I just do, you know, the vascular stuff. And then the OBGYN people would come in and I'd say, well, I'm having this problem. They're like, we don't do the vascular stuff. I mean, they compartmentalize your body. But the problem is, is you don't. You live in your whole body. You don't live in your vascular system or your lymph system. You know, it's all connected. And I think that's the main difference in in the way we approach things that doctors very much compartmentalize and specialize and they don't necessarily think outside that specialty or have knowledge outside that specialty. And I think if there's one thing I keep telling people, it's that it's just that doctors have their place, but we realize they're trained to be specialists. They don't know everything. Right. Remember Deborah, that neck bone is connected to the head bone. And, right. and the, remember that thing they, yeah. they, they lose sight of that. And you're a whole person that you want to come out alive from right. all right. of these things. You still want to come out alive. And they, and they forget that. And I also want to mention, I was going to say, I also want to mention this thing about progesterone because a lot of doctors um, make women scared when they're also progesterone um, positive. So they're Absolutely. ER positive and PR positive. And people think that is a bad thing. And they say, Oh, Ellen's saying to raise your progesterone, but I am PR positive. That's isn't that dangerous? Right. Actually, no. We have a better prognosis um, if you are both ER and PR positive because then you have receptor activity on the PR side as well. So please don't let anybody make you confused on that. Being PR positive is good if you're ER positive. That's absolutely the next thing that I was going to ask you about because very frequently when you are do have an estrogen positive breast cancer. What that means is that your receptors are receptive to estrogen. Progesterone positive means the same thing. You're receptive to progesterone. But if there's one thing to clarify here, progesterone protects us from the effects of excess estrogen. Progesterone is the on the on the seesaw. Progesterone is the thing that keeps estrogen from running wild. So we need progesterone. As you said, it's good to be progesterone positive. It means it's as effective a treatment. You know, when a doctor, when an oncologist looks at an estrogen positive thing, they're like, great, then you'll be responsive to these, you know, estrogen blocking meds. Well, if you're progesterone positive, it means you're also going to be responsive to progesterone, which is equally as estrogen blocking. So great. That's right. So I just want to make sure people, because I get that question asked to me of me all yes, the time. Yes, absolutely. Uh-huh. Let me just ask one last question. And and um, uh, you uh, you are a, a cancer coach, and um, you do coaching with people. And I really I I go back and forth. I mean, you and I we kind of went down the rabbit hole, and we're kind of familiar with coaching and what coaching does. But could you just take our last few minutes here to talk about how? Um, uh, a client could a uh, contact you if and and be in touch with you because um, uh, you do work you and I both work with people nationwide so you don't have to be local but really talk about how someone could benefit from from getting coaching in addition to just the traditional medical advice because I think that can be a big jump for a lot of people and can you really talk about that process of, of coaching and how and and the biggest value you see that that brings to women going through this process sure so the biggest um benefit is that many many women, men too, are really nervous about asking their doctor questions and they will accept a treatment or a recommendation with, even though they're unhappy or they have questions because they don't want to question the doctor. So one role of a coach is to help you answer those questions. The other one is to help you get the all of the research that you need to give you all of the information to make the best choices. So you may have, let's say they, you want to do conventional treatment, but you're really uncertain about this integrative and you don't have an integrative doctor nearby and you want to know all of the things that you can do on your own away from the medical community in conjunction with your treatment and have it be safe and effective. 
there aren't that many integrative doctors out there. So not everyone is, has that available to them. So many people want to know what kind of diet or supplements w- could be helpful w- alongside their conventional treatment. And then others um, actually want me to go to the doctor with them to be their voice. And then others just want to reject all of conventional or just certain parts of conventional. Let's say they do their surgery, their chemo, but they don't want to take an aromatase inhibitor. So then we can work on that and I can give them a plan, a protocol, so to speak, and then guide them in that respect. But a lot of times it's really just to give you peace of mind, to solidify what, what's happening and to clarify what your doctor has said, whether or not you like it. Like some people say, well, I don't like what the doctor said. Well, if it's the truth, and sometimes it's hard to accept the truth, but other times there's things that we can do. Say, well, it's not exactly the case, sort of like the, with the estrogen. Let me explain that to you. So we, really, as a coach, we're, we're kind of charged with making sure that you have every lifeline to survival. You have everything available to you, both, as you said, you know, what doctors don't know everything. They know a lot about their specialty, but they may not be that concerned with the side effects or minimizing the side effects. They say, let us know if you get them. Well, how about preventing them? Right. In other words, if, right, if you, rather than uh, suffer the neuropathy, if I can get you to take a couple of supplements, you know, minor supplements during your, your treatment, maybe you won't get neuropathy. And maybe that doctor hasn't done that kind of research. They say, let me know if it happens. And I say, let's prevent it. So a coach does a lot of different things. But in general, I help you to, to make sense of the diagnosis, to make sense of the treatment options that are offered. And I don't just mean me, all of the coaches, as many of us out there. But our job is to help you understand the causes of cancer. Doctors may say to you, we don't know why cancer happens. You've got bad luck. It's not bad luck. It's not even really genetics to a to big extent. Remember, our genes are not our destiny. Right. So let's change our internal environment to make our, our body inhospitable to cancer. Right. Let's, let's fix our, our broken immune system. Let's tweak this and tweak that. And, you'll, you know, interestingly enough, you don't just survive your cancer. You actually start to feel better when you get rid of the junk food or whatever it was that was weighing you down and, and preventing you from being at your best health. Well, you, there's two things that come to mind when you uh, talk, and it's amazing, even on mainstream sites or mainstream press, how it comes out like, oh, your diet has nothing to do with cancer or yeah. recovery. And it just makes me crazy. And to tell you the truth, that from a nurse's standpoint, most doctors are, I don't know, I'll take that back. Many doctors are still hard pressed to even admit that your nutrition has anything to do with diabetes. And I think most people have, right. you know, made that jump, but you'll still get doctors. As long as you get the food groups in, it's okay. They, yeah. From their point of view, just get yeah. those food groups in. Carbohydrates don't matter. So, so you're, right. you're talking about something that, you know, pretty well, you know, common knowledge is there's a connection. So to, to, so to get a doctor to say, well, your nutrition doesn't matter in cancer, the fact is, is that's one thing that almost any coach is going to be talking to you about is your nutrition and how it's supporting you or how it's not supporting you. That's, that's right. the foundation Everything, of any plan. That's right. Anything you eat and anything you drink and anything you think affects the way your genes behave. Exactly. So we need exactly. to talk to our genes in a very healthy way so that they can really do their job for us. So you can, you know, when you look at your meal, you say, this is either going to help me or hurt me. That doesn't mean you should fear food or, you know, give up everything that you love. Just remember that you make, anytime you can make a healthier choice, you're supporting your genes in a positive way. The other thing that comes up, and I think that this just really is the bottom line for all of these um, uh, estrogen blocking drugs is that, you know, even, you know, taking away, how far you want to go into this, they, for a a significant number of women, if not the majority, they affect our quality of life. They, they put us into premature artificially induced menopause, uh, mood swings, hot flashes, joint pain. It predisposes us to stroke and other forms of cancer and heart attacks. And there are known side effects to all of these. And yet many times you bring them up to a doctor and, um, they'll just dismiss it like it doesn't matter. 
And it's like, I'm sorry, it's not just a matter of living, but it's having a good quality of life and living a life that is that you're enjoying. These things are not insignificant. If you have lost your sex drive because of drugs that you're taking, that's not insignificant and has has huge ramifications, not only for you, but for your partner, you know, for it's a quality of life issue. And I'm so tired of doctors just rolling their eyes like, well, that's just the cost of being alive. Right. It's not. You know, it's funny, Deborah. That's why I named my radio show Survive and Live Well, because you don't yes. just survive. You don't go through all of this to survive cancer and have a miserable life. And be miserable. You want to live well. And actually, I got really mad two summers ago when I saw that one of the major cancer centers stole that from me and use, is now using that in their ads. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, they have some nerve. You know, they don't even know what they don't. They never worry. That particular institution never worries about the quality of their patient's life. And I know that from all of my clients and my family. So we know that that's not their main goal. Um, but so how dare they use that? But anyway, yes, we want to survive and we want to live well. And we want to live well. long, healthy lives. We don't want to be damaged in any way from our treatment. You know, I went to a memorial service a number of years ago. Um, a doctor from Sloan was speaking, and he got up there, and he said, you know, I killed this young lady. He said, oh she God. didn't die of her cancer. He said, but I killed her. Her lungs failed her, yeah. and she was a hiker. And he says, you know, we never realized how much damage we did to these children who have pediatric cancer on, on the, the horrible treatments that they did to these young bodies and these these." many of which these children go on to have really miserable lives, all kinds right. of terrible right. you know, problems. And he basically stood up there and he admitted it, you know, which is rare, but they're looking for safer ways. But Well, that's the one, you know, that's one of the main points that I really like to emphasize is if you're seeing a practitioner who dismisses your issues and dismisses quality of life issues, find someone else. You know, it's like, it's not your job to, you know, enlighten them or educate them. They're just not the person that should be treating you because quality of life matters. You know, right. it's, it's, you know, you can live long and be miserable, you know, or, you know, you can, you can address these things. And, you know, there are, there are options. Unfortunately, it just may not come from the medical, the traditional medical world. They just don't think that way. And, right. and that's, again, where coach, sorry, where coaches come in because, Sometimes you don't have a choice of an oncologist. There may not be another one for 200 miles, and maybe right. you don't have an Aunt Sue that can put you up for six months while you see a doctor. So then that's another reason that people go to coaches, because right. they want to know what they can do to support their bodies during treatment. Again, to mitigate the side effects, and as well as to make the treatment work better. Right. We're not looking at, at, at you know getting in the way of the treatment. We're trying to make the treatments work better. And preserve your quality of life, both during the treatment as well as forever and on, as you become a very healthy person and you want to live a very healthy life. Long well, I think that's a great way to, you know, really wrap up what we're talking about, which is, um, yeah, just just planning for your health, not just in terms of planning for how to treat the disease. You're planning for your long-term health, um, and and um, I, I think that's. Uh, what you and I are, are really trying to get people to think about is, is it, and, and these concerns are important and they matter. They definitely matter. They do. So Ellen, tell, um, uh, can you tell us, uh, what is a good way to, I know you, you, uh, write quite a bit and, and so there's, uh, you've got a lot of, uh, very good information and, uh, writing out there for people to access. And can you let us know how people could contact you or access some sure. of your writing? You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. You can find me via my website, which is um, ellenjacobs.com. That's E-L-Y-N-J-A-C-O-B-S.com. Go to the contact uh, page, and you'll find out how to get in touch with me. That's an email box there you can fill out, and my assistant or I will get back to you. And um, you can also replay my radio show episodes. You can find them on YouTube and on my replay page on my website. Great, great. Oh, Ellen, I so appreciate this. There's so much information here. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to have you back um, at a future episode to, to continue the conversation. I so appreciate you coming on today and sharing all of your information and experience with us. Well, I enjoyed being here. I would certainly come back and chat with you again. I enjoyed it very much. And I think you're doing um, so much good for everybody because this message of integrative health has to get out there. Uh, it just has to. And the more people that support that that notion, um, 
we're going to have a lot of healthier society out there and happier too. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So in terms of closing today, I just want to take a minute. And um, this is a, a very personal tribute that I want to give. Um, I found out this week that one of the most amazing um, uh, warriors that I've known in this battle, she lost her battle this week. She was a young woman. She was, it was actually after my own breast cancer diagnosis and recovery. We were actually both um, uh, fashion models in a, in a fundraiser in the Bay Area. And we, we, uh, it was a beautiful um, um, fashion show and all the survivors, uh, all of the models were survivors. And this woman was, uh, I believe, at the end of her treatment, she had these beautiful tattoos, and she wore this evening gown that was slit down the back, and it just showed her tattoos through this vibrant red gown, and she just rocked that runway. Uh, she was uh, committed to survivors. She worked, um, she worked with survivors to help them around health and fitness, and she was just a lovely, effervescent, uh, wonderful light in this world. And I found out recently that she had had a... Uh, recurrence and then unfortunately this week found out that she um, lost that battle. So I just want to give my tribute and my love to the light um, and the spirit of Kimberly Curry. She's um, a wonderful woman who was a fierce advocate for women and breast cancer survivors and um, Godspeed Kim. We all miss you and we love you. So that, yeah. And, um, but I would have to say if anybody embodied having a wonderful quality of life, she did, she was vibrant and just a really wonderful person and, and just, um, really want to give, um, pay tribute to her and all of us who struggle with getting through this disease and this diagnosis and living our best lives possible. We're, we're all doing it every day and we, when we do it together, we're just that much stronger. Kimberly sounds like she was quite the role model for all of us. An amazing woman. And um, so, yeah, um, just remember, we don't have to do this alone. We have each we other. Do. And remember, too, one last thing I will say is don't forget to find the joy in every day. Exactly. Because through the joy, you, you find a, you, you make yourself happy and you, you, it gives you the will to go on. And also, it's just plain good for you. Right. Joy is important. And we all forget. We learned how to laugh and play when we were kids, and all of a sudden, we don't do it anymore. We, we lose the joy, then we lose the will to live. So find the joy. Get out and play. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to go today to the beach and swim with the dolphins. So that's how I'm Excellent. going to find my joy today. So <laughs> once again, Good. Ellen, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. In wrapping up today's episode, I once again just want to thank Ellen for sharing with us her knowledge and her wisdom and her passion in this area. I so appreciate everything she was able to discuss with us today. And I also want to mention one thing that I think is very prevalent, and that is sometimes the belief that you either go completely traditional medicine or completely alternative. It's presented as an either-or choice. And I don't believe that is true, and I don't believe Ellen believes that is true. It's a matter of integrating the best of both worlds. We definitely need medical treatment. It has a lot to offer. But I think just having an understanding that it's one piece of the puzzle. It's not every piece. And what we were able to talk about today are some of the other puzzle pieces that that we continue to learn about and know and know it affects us as cancer survivors. So I know Ellen is an advocate for knowing your options, as am I. And the truth is, is that knowing your options gives you the best chance of individualizing a plan that works for you. That is what we both encourage. So thank you for joining us today. I would like to also encourage you to consider subscribing and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. It helps in the whole iTunes ratings. I would like to mention my website, mindbodynutritionrn.com, where you can get a free e-guide talking about the estrogen blocking medications we were talking about today and some of the common and known side effects, which I think is a piece of information that we all need to have. So I hope you'll consider checking that out. And I thank you for joining us today. Until next time. 
Take care. Thanks for listening. If you have questions or feedback, you can reach Deborah at RadicalHealthRN at gmail.com or her website, www.MindBodyNutritionRN.com. You can also find us on Facebook under Boobs Aren't Worth Dying For. For future episodes, subscribe on iTunes, where you can also leave positive reviews. Until next time.